you have a phrase um, which is, is somewhat different than, than the one we use, but from visionary to vernacular. Um, and, and that span from being um, so, sort of out there as a dream to something which is now very widely embraced, but as Jim will tell us, not, not enough <laughs> yet. Uh, is, um, yeah, is, has happened in the very short span of time that he's um, been chronicling very well, certainly beyond the city, even though it's called the Agile City. This is taking us um, well beyond the city. So um, yeah, I think you probably also know that he's the architecture critic for Bloomberg News and um, is, uh, is regularly uh, published and read by that vast audience of, of uh, um, important people and opinion makers. Jim. Do I speak near this? Is that what I should do? No, you Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm very happy to be here because, of course, I haven't done the a long time. I really admire what she's uh, been able to accomplish here. So thanks for having me. Um, and there are you know, lots of ways it intersects with your agenda here, as you'll see. Um, so I will do a very quick overview of the book. But I want to start actually at the end of the book because I think I'm getting so frustrated with the insanity, or should I say the inanity of the budget debate in um, Washington, which is sort of precluding us from getting to a lot of the issues we really need to get to. Partly that the last bubble, which everyone is pretending was somebody else's fault, uh, disguised the fact that consumption, you know, which is 60% of our economy, uh, would otherwise really have risen very little uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Not enough to raise standards of living, or um, you know, keep the economy vibrant. We had to cook up a bubble to do that instead. And so this is especially true in the 2000s when middle income wages stagnated. So I'm going to start with the new normal. Uh, click, please. I'll just say click. That's what I can do. Uh, first of all, because there isn't an old normal to go back to. This image is simply um, a, a dead casino in Las Vegas, although I think its bank reluctantly completed it because it was about two thirds done. Uh, and we're instead we're in a kind of um, uh, we have very different forces acting um, on our economy. Click that I think we need to really put, you know put together to understand the sort of crucial nature of dealing with um, climate change and thinking about our economy in a new way. So um, we have you know the collapsing U.S. wealth that's occurred because of the meltdown. We have unrelenting foreclosures, and as Arthur C. Nelson, a um, housing demographer who I've begun to really trust, says we have overbuilt McMansions by five million. So the real question is if we have this 60% of the U.S. economy's consumption, who's going to do the consuming and with what? So click. Uh, the other thing that gets this troublesome is are we really uh, prepared for uh, what's you know happening to us you know, whether or not uh, these is issues are of wet, these weather disasters and flood disasters that we've experienced already this year uh, are climate change related is certainly debated, but the question is where are the resources, they're happening anyway, regardless, where are the resources going to come from? So we have $32 billion in disaster losses in the first six months of 2011 alone, and hurricane season has just begun. The flood insurance program, which we're going to start hearing about a lot more about as people start to recover from these huge floods of the Mississippi and elsewhere, is already in the whole $17 billion. It's supposed to pay for itself. Um, that mainly has to do with Katrina, of course. So who's going to pay for the recovery? What are we doing about prevention? Let's click. Um, we also have what I am beginning to call resource wars. We are in a period of record-breaking food prices, spiking oil prices. If you're in construction, you see it in copper and steel. Um, you may be seeing news coverage of China trying to cut, corner the market on rare earths, which is the little weird, mysterious items that go into cell phones and computers and things. So what we're really seeing is that resource inflation, we're hearing most about oil, but it's really all these things, um, is stalling our recovery in food shortages, which are less noticeable in America, but are spurring food riots and, in fact, are a factor in a lot of the Middle East uh, unrest. So, uh, click on to the next. Uh, we also have nature biting us back. We're seeing declining fisheries. <coughs> I'm going to get through the alarmism, at least 
this quickly. Uh, declining agriculture, declining forests, global water crisis. So you have to ask the question, is an economy based on consumption viable in a resource scarce world? Uh, click. Uh, and so what I'm arguing in the last chapter of the book is why green is going to grow the future and why that word wealth is in the titles. So I've learned something from six years at Bloomberg. Um, <laughs> the old economy, and I owe Michael Gallus for this equation, is that we used resources uh, very inefficiently because they were inexpensive. Um, and they had high environmental impact because we decided it didn't matter. In a green economy, we recognize that we have to have a high resource use efficiency because we're, resources are becoming precious. And we've got to work on low environmental impact because we're running out of environment. Uh, so what I really then begin to argue is that agile cities thrive in a climate change era. Click. Uh, so let's start with the state of the green art today because I'm really arguing in the in the book that it's really cities is the place, and um, also buildings and cities, that is the place, this is how we're going to actually achieve climate change goals, or certainly go a long way to getting them. And so one um, I introduce in the book, I talk about Cruden Hall, because they really, there were a lot of very good metrics on this building to look at, so click. Um, and a few of its many green tactics are visible in this image. You can see the louvers that are protecting the east side of the building. The building is narrow on the east and west side, which uh, reduces the impact of solar heat. Um, it harvests sunlight in the winter and heat on the very broad south side. Click inside. Uh, you can see the louvers again protecting this unbelievably beautiful seminar room. The wood on the ceiling is uh, sustainably harvest from, harvested from Yale's very own forest. We don't all have those, but Yale does. Uh, this room is beautifully top lit, and the light on the sides is very nicely balanced. Windows open, click. Um, uh, many of you, there's many other tactics that many of you will actually be aware of. No, it's too bad about the red. I hope it's at least slightly readable. Uh, more than 20 green tactics in the building um, contribute to a 50% energy reduction over a conventional version of this building. And then they got another 25% energy reduction by putting um, 100 kilowatts worth of solar in various ways on the building for a total of a, uh, almost a 63% smaller carbon footprint. But what, if you can read that, you see that all the conservation elements cost added about 2.4% of the building cost. And the uh, the solar, which only gave half as much uh, advantage, was 2.7% of the building cost. And this is a crucial distinction, especially in the political debate, because what I really argue in the book is that conservation is where we're going to get to our goals, because it's much more efficient, it's much simpler. But what happens, it, and it's much less expensive, but what happens is that in the climate change debate, uh, renewables get lumped in with conservation. And renewables tend to be like wind and solar, much more expensive, perhaps more intermittent, um, an excellent renewable that doesn't get talked about much, that's used in Croon and many other uh, good green buildings is geothermal. Geothermal is consistent, costs very little to run after you deal with its upfront costs and fussiness. So let's go on to the next. Well, let's scale up the question now. What can you do at a community scale? And so I introduced this other uh, project, which um, is actually a carbon neutral project. Uh, Kroon explored getting there, and it would have taken basically a lot more solar, and Yale didn't want to do that. But let's see um, what the advantages operate in a, in a much larger scale. A click. Uh, this is a little overview of it, where you can see it's a big project. 26 buildings, ultimately, this is, I think, the first one and a half phases, and much more is now complete. It's mixed use. The buildings in the front are um, office buildings. The others are residential building. There's a bike path called the Galloping Goose, which has now become an important commuting artery in Victoria. You could take a little ferry that's very cute. It's a passenger ferry that goes to that little dock and takes you in a few minutes to downtown Victoria. Um, let's. Uh, click on. Uh, well, there's a number of, uh, uh, at the building level, 
there are things like you see those blue stripes, those are actually awnings that deploy automatically when the sun is actually out, which is not hugely often in Victoria, but more often than the rest of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the apartments, because of their shape, are naturally ventilated. It's got a wide assortment of other green tactics. But I'll draw attention to this little stream in the foreground, which actually harvests the rainwater runoff from the site. But it also um, takes water that comes from an on-site sewage treatment plant. So this development can actually process its own sewage and dispose of its own um, irrigation water in a very uh, environment and turn it into an amenity. So bird, this is a, about a three-year-old photo. Now this is much lusher. Birds flock. There are critters living in the water. And it's a really wonderful amenity for the, um, the development, which has actually uh, sold very well. And of course, Canada has not been uh, brutalized by the economy quite as much as America. This is it, how it gets to uh, net zero, which is its biomass gasification plant. So it takes waste wood from the wood products industry, turns it into a very clean fuel, uh, creates all hot water and heating water for the development, doesn't need air conditioning because of the way it's made and because of the climate. Uh, and it also sells a little bit off of um, site to another user and therefore makes up for the electricity that the development still needs, therefore net zero. Click. And it, you know, it operates in the conventional market, it competes with conventional projects, uh, it's uh, got more platinum points uh, in the lead and D scoring system than anything else I think that's come along. So it gets a 50% uh, energy reduction through its conservation um, tactics and its car carbon neutral largely through the clean fuel gasification boiler. But think of the other advantage that it has. It reduces people's travel need because it's got a car sharing program. There are bus lines. You can take the ferry. You can ride your bike. Uh, so it begins to develop these uh, larger scale uh, aspects of you know, communities working together that begin to get us to really powerful click um, reductions in greenhouse gases and energy. So where I'm going with the book is buildings plus communities plus infrastructure equals very powerful potential. So probably you've seen some of these before, but on the community level we can deal with storm, floods and droughts. We can do all kinds of things with power by shifting demand. Uh, by cogeneration, through the things like the gasification plant, and we can integrate tactics where we get uh, larger benefits than the individual tactics would suggest. Click. Uh, and so I begin to talk about how urban agility meets climate change goals, especially compared to what the big climate change debates, the political climate change debate, seems to be about in America, which is about Oh, we've, we've got to get clean coal, we've got to sequester carbon, we've got to have safe nuclear power. But what those are are great big command and control technologies that require enormous upfront investments when what you're doing with conservation and modest renewables is you have incremental, many, many tactics, many technologies, many different ways of approaching it, uh, which means lower risk, incremental investments, not gigantic investments, but also in the process you can begin to restore and reweave natural systems for resilience, so you can address those questions of declining agriculture, declining forests, declining water quality, declining fisheries, and you make human networks that are more adaptable. By this I mean primarily transportation, but you know utility infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, so the result, I argue, is that we build well-being and wealth simultaneously. Click. Um, so but, you know, since Agile's in the title, uh, what makes a city Agile? Uh, I think cities have been Agile forever. I mean, that's how cities have survived. They change. They adapt. And so we won't need cities actually to be Agile in an environmental sense we're looking for new technologies, new business models, new ways to do business and to break down barriers. Something goes wrong with the slide every time. 
We put in <laughs> barriers. We question <laughs> habit. We break down regulatory policy and turf barriers. We're proactive. We anticipate the future and takes it in hand. So though I work for a company named Bloomberg, this is certainly the agenda of the city. I'm not supposed to you know, aggrandize the mayor in my work for Bloomberg, but certainly that's very powerfully the agenda of the city. And other cities, too. Click. And really, this happens to be a picture of Hamburg, which I'm going to get back to. But uh, successful cities for hundreds of years have been agile. They adapt. They look for the new thing. That's really the point. And now we need to turn it to the new challenge, which is climate change. Click, I mean, among the many new challenges. And one of the ways I do that is to think about land. We really do need to rethink land and our property rights questions. And I use Oregon's growth boundaries and Portland's kind of renaissance as one way of, of thinking about land. I'm not by any means saying it's the only way to click. Uh, what you have is a growth boundary, and you can see the powerful effect it's had on the urban form. Because you see the rural area where you could build maybe one house every 80, 80 acres here, and the urban uh, side, which you typically in Portland's about eight dwelling units per acre. By contrast, click, we have uh, the outskirts of Vancouver, Washington, right across the Columbia River. This is maybe 10 miles as the crow flies. And you see the usual diffuse suburban to exurban uh, pattern. Um, and uh, but what you get in Oregon, click, is uh, so this very clean divide. But uh, you get unbelievably productive farmland. And I took this picture in the process of doing a story for Metropolis about property rights because uh, there's the property rights people hate the growth boundaries. I've been hating them in a big way for about 20 years. And they got a, a uh, measure passed by the voters that began to undo this very clear uh, dividing line. So you can you could barely see it even if the picture was uh, running a little bit clearer. It took a tiny little brown line that separates two properties. Right now, they're both zoned full agricultural. But because of the certain bizarreness of this ballot measure, this side could have gone to about uh, five acre lots, and this side uh, would have to remain in farmland. The, uh, chapter and verses in the book. It's too complicated for this discussion. But to suffice it to say that the bad ballot measure backfired because people thought they were going to be fair and they didn't succeed. So click. But in the meantime, and the, it's, this border has been in, in force since 1973, it really began to uh, start to change things inside the boundaries because developers couldn't just go endlessly into open land. So they began to rethink what you could do, and these are just a couple quick examples. The Pearl District is part of uh, the fame, you know, the sort of renaissance of Portland. And this kind of density is very unknown. It was very unknown in Portland. It's happened very rapidly, click. Um, but this is another peculiar thing that happened, that this tram uh, was built to deal with a hospital which is up on a ridge top and very landlocked didn't know what to do. So because uh, you, you began to see a cadre of developers who were trying to figure out how to do infill in all kinds of new ways, they came up with the idea, well, let's connect this to the flatlands of this tram. Click. So this is up in the hilltop. Down here, this was a brownfield site along the Willamette River that because you know, there, there are forces of growth, there's that developer can say, okay, I can justify transforming this uh, brown field into a mixed-use development that not only serves the medical center up top, but has a lot of other uses, office uses and residential uses, have been very successful. And the city put in a streetcar, so you can now take the streetcar from the downtown to this tram, which of course is totally fun uh, to ride up and down. Uh, spectacular views out across the city when the cloud is permit, click. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing that probably would not happen in most American cities, but does happen because people are looking for different ways to skin the cat um, in Portland. Another reason we have to think about land is rescuing the riskiest places. So I talk a lot about the Ocean Edge click. Uh, this is one response to uh, Hurricane Katrina in Biloxi. Basically this person, a 30 foot high wave surge, probably about where the top of that house is, uh, crossed into this area and obliterated, you can see a pad, um, uh, this part of Biloxi, and this owner says, I'm building back, 
I'm building the fortress. I don't care what anyone says, this is what I'm doing. Click. We saw a similar response in uh, New Orleans where when people didn't really know what FEMA regarded as safe, they just began to develop, they built back to their own assessments of risk. So you see, this is a person who is very risk averse, you know, over here, the other end, it's like, we don't care. If it happens, it's gonna happen, and then a couple in between. Uh, now, who's right? Who's taken, who's made the right bet? We don't really know, but is this the way we're gonna make our future? It's kind of the way we are making our future. Like, uh, I looked at you know a couple places like uh, Seabride in New Jersey, which um, I went here a few years ago, probably about 10, 15 years, and this big uh, barrier was actually a cliff on the left. But you know they've coerced the federal government to put a lot of sand there, so now it's a nice beach. But you can see on the other inland side, you know how massive a fortification this really is, and uh, you know this is a pretty expensive and fairly unsatisfying uh, response. Like, uh, you know, it has to be continuously maintained. I just went down on a winter day, and what are they doing? Dredging and filling and keeping it up. Click. Uh, so, I'm not going to explain what all these things are, but partly it's like we've got all these at-risk places along the coastline. What are we going to do? Well, in fact, right now, we don't really have a plan uh, for most of it. Uh, so, what I did was borrow a bunch of land use ideas that are used for other purposes. Mitigation banks are used for highways that run through swamps. Land trusts may be familiar to you, often used to conserve valuable lands. Land readjustment used in a lot of other countries like Holland have water problems for hundreds of years, not used here. Uh, leasing, not owning. You lease land and then when it's endangered, uh, your owner can take it back and you really lose a minimum amount. So again, we have to start thinking about beyond this idea of like, well, we purely preserve land, or we kind of let anything go as so the private owner builds their fortresses or builds up or down as much as they think. Click. Uh, I also um, talk about the dysfunctional growth machine, which is, you know, really the, the forces, especially if you're architects, um, you're probably a little less acquainted with these forces than you should be, but anyone who's a fan of Carol knows that form does drive finance. Um, and, uh, or finance, I've gotten it wrong. Form then, follows finance. Form follows finance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, click. Uh, so real estate, one of the things that happened in Biloxi is that people decided, well, we need to rebuild uh, hurricane safe, flood safe, but we want to make it green, we want to make it affordable. So you see this kind of event of little house that happened in Biloxi uh, by Architecture for Humanity and a group out of Mississippi State, click. You see Global Green, a Santa Monica, California environmental organization that built a bunch of prototype houses, click, and you see Make It Right, this one has to be my, or Fosis the Brad Pitt inspiration, actually you know, Global Green too, that's building 150 houses in the lower ninth ward, all with similar ideas. The one thing that falls by the wayside is affordability. Uh, they are trying to get these done for all of these for roughly under $150,000. Uh, I don't think any of them would come near it. So they have to go and raise money to try and make it happen. Well, the, to me, the bizarre aspect of this is that all these were done not by knowledgeable, smart developers, not by uh, brilliant banks who say, gee, if we just figured out a great way to finance this, we can make something really fantastic happen in New Orleans. No, it was done by little nonprofits who didn't know any better. They didn't know that the real estate industry in America is not set up to innovate. It's not set up to do green. It's not really very well set up even to do, um, you know, flood resistant and wind proof. Uh, and I find this appalling. Uh, click. Uh, but you know, these are another, this is another very inventive. It's now the biggest tourist attraction outside the French Quarter is Maker Pride. So someone's got a private residence sign. Uh, this is by Karen Timberlake, but also, you know, trying to recapture that sense of sociability that's so important in New Orleans. And one of these houses I actually saw, and people really do, I mean, because it's so powerful a force there. And I saw guys, you know, playing cards on a card table in the, underneath because, you know, of course, raising them up is a new thing in New Orleans. And they said, well, not totally new, but um, anyway, click. They're very adaptable. Um, so really, 
the big question I ask is why you can't do what these little nonprofits doing. It's because it's very commoditized. In other words, real estate knows how to do strip malls. It does not know how to rebuild New Orleans. Um, Christopher Leinberger sort of codified what real estate readily finances into what he calls 19 product types, 17 of which he deems sprawling. Also that real estate finance is all about very short investment cycles, which anyone who's tried to do green buildings knows makes it hard to make certain tactics pay back. Uh, and tax code has encouraged the larger for sale houses, hence the five million too many McMansions click. So the consequences is, you know, it misses entire markets. Uh, Leinberger talks in his book, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, Christopher Leinberger, remember that name. Um, this is the entire walkable, what he called walkable or menaced market, but other people have argued this too. Um, the overbuilding, really it penalizes communities for getting old. That's why inner suburbs are now beginning to suffer the same fate as older cities long have. Um, drives low quality, fast payback construction, click. Uh, so we really want to think about what agile real estate would look like. And I'm just going to quickly show you one example. This one happens to be in Hamburg. And I actually spent a lot of time, a click, with people in Germany trying to say, how do you justify buildings like this that we cannot make environmentally, I mean, economically viable in the US? And so there's a lot in the book about that. This uses a, a kind of pillowy uh, fabric called ETFE that helps to insulate the building, also stops the gruesome winds that Hamburg can have, click. Uh, it's got numerous low energy, it's nat energy aspect, it's naturally ventilated, it's beautifully daylit, it looks a little grim in this photo, but it, trust me, um, that's a very nice LED light fixture, that, that rim, it's almost never on. And when this is full of daylight, this atrium just also becomes full of people. They take their meetings, they take their coffee, um, the building's naturally ventilated, it's very low energy, although some of the best uh, American buildings are very close to what this one achieves, click. But you know, with a really kind of workplace that everyone would kill to be in. So I also argue for re-engineering transportation and click. Um, I use Riverside Park as an example of, you know, it's a park, it's a highway, it's got a railroad in it, post bicycles. We don't build this way, we're not allowed to build this way. Click. Um, so I show examples of what we could be doing. This is a bicycle garage at the central station. In Amsterdam, it happens to park 5,000 bicycles. It's not just about bicycling. People long have bicycled in Amsterdam. It's about connecting people on bicycles to other forms of transportation, in this case, commuter rail, the inner city rail that takes people to the back and forth to their jobs and other destinations. We're not very good at connecting transportation together in America by mode. Click. Um, maybe some of you have taken that sad little long rail to Newark Airport, and that's an example. Now, my good friend Bob Brookman says, oh, you know, sprawls everywhere, kind of looks the same the world over, and you can easily mistake this for an American suburban downtown. It has to be suburban Amsterdam. The difference being that there's, this is a great big railroad station in the foreground. Again, it connects it, this development to the airport. It connects it to places all over Holland. Uh, and so, again, you've got a lot of different ways of accessing this place. But also what I would tell Uncle Rupin, which he doesn't always notice, is that when you walk into this facility, what you don't see are the parking lots and the parking structures of America, suburban downtowns, because very few people drive to this destination. Click. Uh, of course, we all know in New York, we're beginning to learn to share streets with people, not just cars. Click. Uh, and, you know, beginning to think about diversifying our transportation modes again. This is just a wonderful train station in Berlin that not only has high-speed rail, it has local rail, it has intercity rail, click. And architecturally, you can actually see all these different layers, which I think is really wonderful. It connects well to the subway. We're just, again, not so good at that in, in America, click. Um, we talk about green streets or complete streets. This one has to be in Bilbao. The bike lane, the car lane, the tram lane, you know, the sidewalks, we're getting we're moving toward this in America, but it's pretty, I still don't have an example I could show in America, but they're moving ahead in some, in some places, click. Um, so again, why can't we build this way? We compartmentalize our funding. It becomes enormously difficult to connect modes together. 
we get into one size fits all things, freeways. Or when we go to the transit side, we go for light rail. Or now streetcars are the new mode of choice. But the thing is, we need them all. You know, we just need them applied where they belong. We need to move autos, not people. I mean, we need to move people, not automobiles. We need to collect activity nodes, not run beltways around cities, which are really, as I argue, sort of development devices, not really some transportation solutions. Of course, the agencies don't work together, and we don't recognize multiple benefits. We don't talk about traffic reduction. We don't talk about pollution. We don't talk about reducing oil and poison. It's, it's, it's not allowed. Click. Uh, so I spent a lot of the book uh, talking about agile urban futures, which is primarily examples. But also talk a little bit about loose, well, we'll, we'll get there. Click. Um, so really when I talk about architecture, the one choice I've made, because I'm really trying to reach a readership broader than professionals, is to talk about climate-sensitive architecture. Uh, and so, you know, it's an easy place to start, is uh, the South and its wonderful traditional architecture, or the shot gun, which everybody working in um, New Orleans worships. Uh, the idea, if you're not familiar, is that the air goes in one end and goes all the way through and out the other. Um, in these more modest variations, you sacrifice a lot of privacy for that. But you know, you also see the porch, which is a climate protection device, as well as a social device. You see the shutters, which are actually used, they're not decorative. A lot of these that, uh, that the least raised off the ground, it's not a solid foundation, so if there's a breeze, you can get in underneath and get a little cooling underneath. Uh, click. Um, to compare to you know what's more recent kind of construction in New Orleans, which is you know ranch houses on slab on grade. So when after the flooding um, receded and the water been sitting around, all those foundations buckled. These houses became useless. They don't cross ventilate. Uh, they have a sort of um, decorative porch rather than a useful one. And so what you find is tremendous numbers of these have not gotten fixed up, have not gotten, um, people have not returned to that click. Um, I run around the New uh, Northeast. Uh, this happens to be Orient on the eastern end of Long On. I really talk about how historic homes there are not only oriented to the prevailing breeze, as this one is, and of course the porch is a wonderful uh, place to be, as well as an environmental um, element. Um, click. But these houses tend to dispose themselves to get, catch the breeze. Again, the porch is there to shade in summer. But they have a compact form, which is useful uh, in the winter. Uh, click. Um, you, if you have more money, you can have a more elaborate version where the cupola, you know, helps the nap with the chimney effect, helps the natural ventilation. You have more elaborate porches and more of them. You have higher ceilings on the ground floor, which helps the air to move around. Click. Uh, and then you can go to some place like San Francisco and do a modern take, as Morphosis did in the federal office building. The buildings naturally ventilate. That's a metal mesh which keeps uh, the sun off. It lets the air go through. Uh, those sort of uh, portable things punching out are actually stairways so that you get really nice views as you're going up and down. And you also you encourage people not to take an elevator each floor, but you use the stairs to get up and down so that you will actually meet people, talk to them, share ideas. That's a great big porch up there. Click. On the north side, um, these are actually trying to harvest some daylight, these fins. Um, and this building is uh, almost entirely daylighted and naturally ventilated. Click. I don't know how this picture is going to work. Um, the, actually, the up lights are on, but on the day I was there, they didn't need to be. Uh, but this is not a very deep floor plate, so you can get the daylight in, the windows open, there are shades that go down if you need them, uh, and so it's actually an incredibly pleasant building to be in. Click. Uh, this is a very adventurous building in uh, Manitoba, in Canada, which probably you know counts as having a very extreme climate, frigid in the winter, roasting in the summer, uh, hot wind, some humidity, um, Black people live there. Anyway, uh, what you see, this uh, little crater here is actually what they call a solar chimney. In the summer, the sun hits it. It's very heat absorbent, and it starts, uh, the chimney effect draws air all the way through the building and out. 
exhaust it. You shut that off in winter. I use heat exchangers inst instead. Uh, this is a big double wall, curtain wall click. Uh, on the south side, they have these um, winter gardens, which you can imagine on an unbelievably frigid day in Winnipeg are extremely welcome. They harvest the solar heat from the south. This is actually a kind of big air mixing box. So you get a little preheat from the sun in winter. It's, it's sunny a lot there, so they can harvest this. And then they use it as a preheat and then start pumping it into the uh, building, uh, augmenting the heat as needed. Those little ribbons that you can see are actually ribbons of metal. And if they need to humidify this uh, air, they can actually let water dribble down it. So it's a very elegant way to do uh, some very climate sensitive design by KPMB out of Toronto, click. Um, uh, when you think about port cities, they're probably most adaptable on Earth because the technology of shipping keeps changes. So now I'm back to Hamburg. And uh, this happens to be the Spikerstadt, which was uh, kind of a city built for shipping. And the ships would come in and uh, send their cargo in. The tidal action's really gigantic in Hamburg, so this is a low tide situation. And uh, these are basically warehouses that would then uh, store and process um, um, goods and send them out the other side into the city or to other ships. Click. So that was a 19th century had a version of agility. So then they moved the port, you know, largely down the river a little bit. This is the Elbert River, and uh, built on um, some land. Click uh, that they didn't need any more for shipping what's called Hoffman City, Hamburg, and set extremely ambitious climate uh, change and energy goals for the city. One of the reasons being is the Elbe drains a huge chunk of Europe, and the uh, water levels are rising, and they're getting more flooding. In the meantime, when you get storms going up on the uh, Baltic, it's sending water up the river from the ocean. So it's all meeting in Hamburg. So this is a city that's adapting to climate change effects while it's trying to reduce greenhouse gases uh, and doing it rather elegantly click. Uh, so what you actually see is a kind of two-layer pedestrian system. The lower la layer is usable most of the time. But you can see where that railing is. That's the upper layer. That becomes an escape route in the event of flooding. Uh, you can perhaps see in these images that a lot of these buildings are very low energy, they're protected by external sh shutters. This is in a climate where it's not wildly sunny, um, but it's justified in Germany by the way you know energy is much more expensive um, and the way that the regulations that apply to Hoffman City are developed to click. Uh, this is a flood uh, accepting esplanade by the Barcelona firm EMBT, which is a very fun and elegant place. And Hamburg does not have a ton of its waterfront open to the public. So this is wildly popular because it opened up a huge expanse of waterfront and made it really beautiful and appealing. Now, all the functions that you see along that wall behind the Esplanade can accept flooding. There's parking garages and there are shops, but click, I put in the image, yeah. They can all be protected by these massive doors when the floods come, click. Uh, and another way that they, and so this bi-level pedestrian system is to make it possible for people to escape off and in the event of floods. You can use both levels most of the time, all the time, except when a flood isn't it. But the expectation is that the water can actually inundate that lower level. So this is how they're beginning to um, deal with what's going on in, in the city. Click. Um, I talk about loose fit urbanism because one of the things that's appealing about the conventional development that we have in America and why we might end up defaulting back to it even though you know there's a lot of reasons not to. So one thing about outer suburban development is that it's straightforward to develop. It's easy to finance, it's easy to build, plop that house in the middle of the piece of land. Um, there's a ready supply of inexpensive land because we tend to put freeways and beltways out to serve it. Um, but, uh, and so it's accessible to transportation and there are low barriers to entry because in the outer suburbs there tend to be a lot of jurisdictions competing for development. So they reduce, they make strict uh, regulations straightforward, they make permitting straightforward. So this is the sort of Houston-Dallas formula. And so I ask myself, what can you do to make that happen in 
uh, infill situations and in city situations. And uh, it's really, again, dealing with the, na the nature of finance and the nature of regulation that tends to forget about these kinds of issues. Click. So, you know, but we see some things happening even without, you know, a real change in the growth machine. Uh, this is a sort of infill uh, walkable development in um, what was a very conventional suburban shopping center site outside of Denver called Belmar. And so some of this is sort of like loft living and they have art galleries and they mix the uses up, and even though it still has a big mall component to it. But it's really changed the nature of this inner suburb that was kind of struggling. Click. Um, this happens to be near where I grew up in Seattle. This is Mercer Island, uh, which is a suburb that you can see in the foreground, very much the parking lot, one story um, uh, strip mall, conventional construction. But they've begun to change the regulations to you know, make it more walkable, to encourage infill. Um, not always brilliant architecture, but you know, on the way, and it also happens to be a very uh, big nexus of transportation. You can really get around the metropolitan area very readily by bus from this place. Click. So this is how they repurpose, you know, the usual wide boulevard and parking lot landscape to make something that's fairly uh, pleasantly walkable and people like it, and it's doing reasonably well considering the economy. Click. Our sign is very desirable. So, you know, really that is a quick overview. I wanted to maybe just do a little quick uh, summation about, I think, how we're going to have to really think broadly whether you like the examples in the book or don't, or like my recommendations or not. Uh, but I think we're going to really have to regard resources as precious and expensive, whatever goes on with gyrating oil prices. And by that I mean not just you know, oil and energy, but minerals, forests, farms, these things that are really going to become more valuable to us in the future. Otherwise, we would not be having a record uh, in, uh, food prices in the midst of a really gruesome recession. Um, that restored ecosystems will gain value because there's not enough wood in the world. There's not enough fish in the sea. Uh, and low energy buildings are going to pay because energy is going to get too expensive. Um, to think about how we can reweave re natural systems because that will help, you know, point A work, reduce land fragmentation, um, avoid building in precious landscapes as, uh, you know, why not North Dakota is just finding out. Uh, we need to, you know, already we're, there's a lot of cities like New York pushing us to conserve fresh water, to clean or reuse waste water. This is actually one of these things that's moving unbelievably fast. All, I have now like 12, you know, cool new examples that I didn't have when I was wrapping up the book, which is only a year ago. Uh, we're going to be looking at restoring eroded and damaged landscapes. Um, but the other things we have to um, do evidence-based design is now the new uh, watchword. We need to benchmark achievements of green um, as lead does. A lot of people think lead is too much of a check mark, check Checklist, it's not um, a, a flexible enough tool, but the point is, and it's one thing I've certainly learned at Bloomberg, is that investors want things that they can analyze, that they can compare, and they can benchmark. And actually, Bloomberg is beginning to roll out all sorts of tools that I don't even know about that are going to really help this to happen. Uh, actually, maybe not in real estate, but in basically everything else. And of course, you know, it seems completely obvious and involve people that people forget. So my little epilogue is actually about charrettes and other forms of community involvement. I think are a little richer than the you know public hearing model that tends to be a little overused in New York. Uh, because change is scary to people. So click. Uh, oh, and I just wanted to throw this in because it the color's a little ghastly. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and you know, I had a really wonderful walk with Michael Van Balkenberg and the sun's going down. It's a wonderful place. But one of the things he makes is a little salt marsh. Salt marsh across from, you know, the great skyline. I think it's the most marvelous romantic thing. And it's already happening. I mean, it looked so dead and bare. And I said, you have got to be kidding when I first saw this in the winter. And now it's already, you know, real. You know, it's amazing. Click. So that's the end. Thanks.
the one. Well, I, okay, I have, I have sure. lots of questions in it. And To, to really analyze what works in a really hard and critical way. Like my, my and you, have a, you suggested that through walkability and some of the units, units per acre. Uh, but I think that this approach, which isn't policy, it is, you are making policy recommendations, yeah. but let's say that that will always be frustrated by politics, right? Policy recommendations get, are just um, become the victim of whatever politics we're enmeshed in right. at the moment. But it seems to me in the same way that Jane Jacobs was able to say, you know, look at the city and, you know, here are the lessons and these things don't really change. This is the way people act and react in spaces. That the, the, that the value of doing this is to say, you know, these are the things that work. And um, I don't know where that, that leads except to separate To, to say that the designer's ability to show what based on their examples, the policies should change. Well, I, I try to put as many examples as I could yeah. in the book because the reality is that people understand examples better than they understand mm -hmm. abstract arguments. So uh, it's one reason it's full of examples. But the other thing is examples are powerful. Uh, when people see it, it tends to become more believable. And uh, that is part of, I think, a change of heart that tends to go on. The other thing is, I think the policy side is not, um, you know, a dead end. I, I think, you know, one of the things you, t when I talk to people, is that, you know, even when you go places where, I mean, I'm in Utah, and people say you can't say the words climate change in Utah, <laughs> which of course is false to begin with. But in fact, people, that doesn't mean they're not paying attention. The Latter-day Saints Church is building a huge development um, in downtown Salt Lake City to lead silver, not wildly impressive, but progress. And a lot of people would say, why are you bothering? And it's also connected to the light rail line. Salt Lake City and Dallas are building more light rail, rail miles than anybody. So what happens is it kind of goes sub rosa. And I think what you also talk about it, there was a very nice panel at this Urban Green uh, conference. I was just on. I was quite uh, amazed by my panelists, both the mere moderator. And this guy from Kansas says, look, we can't talk about climate change to farmers. We talk about benefits. We talk about conservation. We talk about benefits. We talk about expensive oil. We talk about what we can get out of it. And that is the other thing is you don't have to, I even now wonder if I should have not put climate change in the title of my book. Because it is a turn off to people to some extent. And it's also, it's like, oh, it's another book about climate change, and it's one of the market hurdles to overcome, because it's much more than that. But um, the, you can, I think if you do argue based on evidence and you argue based on benefits, people begin to understand it. And also people in their heads kind of know it's happening, even if they're not quite um, accepting it. And guess who really knows the oil companies? Because they're already being affected by it. You cannot drill in the Arctic and pretend climate change doesn't exist. Climate change makes it possible to drill in the Arctic. Uh, you can't drill in the Gulf of Mexico without considering that, guess what? Those hurricanes might be made worse by um, climate change. You know, it's utterly imprudent when you're throwing up much money around. So when you talk to them when they're not in their political stance, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we don't want the example that you gave about Hamburg, was that driven by the government or private? Well, the city, I think, drove it, but Hamburg is a um, very successful city, and I think they regard it as a competitive um, advantage. Uh, it's really extending their downtown. And uh, yes, things we tend to be driven by government. And when I was talking to real estate people in 
Germany was very interested and said, oh yeah, if it was if the real estate bill had that way, they wouldn't have, you know, all these regulations they have there. And actually are even adding the lead on to their low energy complexity over there. Um, but uh, on the other hand, they it's a competitive advantage because people are interested in it. People want to live healthy lives, and Germans are very much fresh air fiends, and they do tend to be green, more green in their political leaning. Um, but also, part of it is you when you wrap it up in a beautiful esplanade that you can get to on rapid transit, uh, that is a wonderful place to walk and a wonderful place to bike to. Then suddenly you're not, it's like, I'm not doing it because it's green, I'm doing it because we have made an addition to our downtown that is clean, it's fresh, the water looks clean, I have no idea how clean it actually is, uh, it feels very healthy, it's got tons of amenity, and partly because you can, you know, marry amenity and, um, you know, energy conservation pretty readily in architecture. So you sell the amenity. Sure. Jim, something's Right at the beginning, you said 60% of our economy is consumption. And it linked into something that, about climate change, because I've heard that the core problem about global warming is our desire to consume. And so, is there another, I and mean, you putting your Bloomberg hat on, is there another model of economy that doesn't involve consumption? Well, I think what I think about when I'm writing about to my Bloomberg customers is um, a lot of them are, you know, 30-year-old traders on Wall Street who are trying to make as much money as they can because they want the Ferrari, they want the big car, they want the fancy boat, they want the goodies. So I actually have to deal with that to some extent. And part of it I sort of look at it as appetite. Uh, that the appetite does not necessarily have to be focused into things. You have to deal with the appetite. I didn't really go into this in the book, but what I do inside my head. So a lot of it is dealing a little bit with appetite. And the other aspect is consumption very broadly. In other words, healthcare is regarded as consumption. If healthcare costs go up, it makes our GDP look higher, which makes us look richer when we're really poorer. It's one reason a lot of economists are now exploring alternatives to GDP, and why you hear so much about happiness. You know, because they're trying to say, well, maybe our economy should be about happiness and well-being, which is why it's So important. there's uh, another... So but all this is in flux, but the political debate is like, the only way we can have more jobs is we have to have more consumption, which means people have to buy more televisions, which are not made in America, and people have to buy more cars, which are only partly made in America, and people have to buy more stuff. And the whole idea of the big house thing is if you buy a big house, then um, the strip malls come because you have to go from the big house to the strip mall to buy the furniture and the televisions and all the things that are going to fill up this house. So it all seemed like it was working until we found out that American incomes were not supporting all that. And so it was this big house of cards built on, you know, uh, let's get the Chinese to buy the debt, which they succeeded in doing now in this huge mess. The other. And so they all, all the political debate is like, how do we boost consumption? That's what they talk about all the time. It's like, honey, honey. When you boost consumption, then the oil prices go up and it just bites you right back. The other statistic which is worth pointing out is they say that 75% of our health care costs are because of our lifestyle choices. Well, so that you can't, you're getting young, I think. Right? <laughs> you can't, you can't uh, squeeze any more efficiency out of our health care system, but if we ate better, got more walking in, we'd have less obesity, less diabetes, and those are things that drive up our health care costs. So you could make the argument that there are other forms of happiness, like walking. Well, I think that's beginning to happen. I mean, there's a, you know, it's not only that Elaine de Bolton or whatever his name is, but it keeps popping up and I actually can't keep up with it. it it's actually, I think, a lot of economists, I mean, suddenly a lot of economists are starting to look at, I think only a couple, I saw a couple in, um, in the book, but I think increasingly the economists are looking like the old rules are not working. What does this really work? And really, economists have to recognize this resource scarcity thing. Um, and that is really a lot driven by China, India, and these 
which I meanted, which I used to have a slide on. I think I was trying to make this shorter. Not better, but anyway, these very large populations in Indonesia and Mexico, um, as they move up the ladder, even if they're only crawling up a little up the ladder, the impact on resources is humongous, which is why we're having these shortages and spikes now. It's really because of them. So we just have to stop them from growing. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> you see that that doesn't go very far. And especially when America consumes a quarter of the world's output of oil, you could say we're pigs. You can also say we are have made ourselves unbelievably vulnerable to, to oil. More vulnerable than almost anybody. So, in the battle. And for fluid on the climate action plan. Sorry, what? I'm sure we have this climate action plan. Uh -huh. And so uh, and two of the things I want to know is, has that improved their monitoring? And also, they also say that they're... I'm uh, sorry, who has the climate action plan? It's Chicago, Chicago. Chicago. Some, some call their Chicago. climate action plan. Chicago. 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 Okay. Chicago. Chicago. Okay. They have a website, and they have final, like, 20 or something. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, I just wonder whether they have improved their monitoring. I have an advanced idea. Okay. What, what I really see happening, uh, people ask me variations on my question is that cities are using green as a competitive, uh, in certain parts of New York, is it, as a competitive argument. In other words, and the way somebody very smart put it to me, is a proxy for other kinds of performance. It's another performance. In other words, if this is a city that's smart enough to integrate bike lanes and um, make up transportation parking, it's not, no longer brain dead. If this is a city that can really begin to diversify its ways of dealing with transportation, which I think businesses are also getting to realize is very, very, very important. And this is a city that's probably good at a lot of things. And so maybe I should think about putting my business here. The other aspect of it is cities that are greener tend to um, uh, attract a better workforce, more educated, more entrepreneurial, more innovative. So if you want that, you go green. I mean, Austin has a harder time attracting tech, you know, say tech capital, tech people than Seattle or San Francisco. The big plus it's got going for is that it's a lot cheaper. Um, if you take that away, then Austin would fold up and die because people are going to places like Seattle and San Francisco uh, and, and Boston because they're amenable cities and they are, they are, they feel like the kind of places a lot of young people want to live in. So that's the way, you know, Fundamentally, a bond rating is about are you, you know, spending yourself into oblivion? Uh, that was another question. I, I just, uh -huh. the, um, the idea that, that we're nibbling around the margins of these issues with this yeah. not being able to mention climate change in the same breath as the public uh, or whatever, uh, that, that's a kind of uh, backdoor resurgence of good old American pragmatism. You seem to find that it's not going to scale up. And no, wonder, it's not going to be enough. Right, which I think is uh, not so difficult to understand. But short of the usual mechanisms for paradigm shifts, which are either complete or near complete collapse, what what can uh, what can be done? I mean, well, as you know from the world, it's complete collapse is going to be a fairly terrible paradigm for trying to innovation. Quite. Um, disasters. Don't work. I mean, look at how the financial crisis has completely frozen our political process. I mean, we're no, we're just no more on again. And uh, so, part of it obviously is, you know, thinking ahead and being prepared. Um, and first of all, you have to think of the worst case scenario. You have to present the worst case scenario. That doesn't mean anyone's going to like act on it. And also say, what are the solutions? I mean, whether like. Talk about land use, which tends to make a lot of people's eyes go, uh, you know, start to, you know, go down. But land is, use is so important about how things can happen. Um, it's why they're still having Jim works in a lot of the realms. It's very aware of this debate that they're still having about how do we deal with these neighborhoods that we're not coming back, we're not coming back enough, and uh, we. There was never a mechanism. And to try and put in a mechanism 
after the disaster was cause the city to explode. And that's pretty much what goes on in the national um, debate. So now is the time to say, well, what are some paradigms that could work? And increasingly, I think people are beginning to introduce some in the more lines. I think they're actually beginning to get some traction. But one of the reasons I have that little laundry list of land trusts and things like that is I think uh, none of those are really used in a climate change or disaster context in America. But we're going to have to start thinking about that. And I would love if somebody in New Orleans would say, OK, do any of these models fit? And if what would we have to do to make them fit? And by having that discussion, you begin to develop possibilities. So it goes beyond, like, let's make a cool prototype house. I think now the thing is, like, let's make a cool prototype land use mechanism that, I mean, one thing about land readjust that's not very scary is you choose a tract of land, you dissolve all the boundaries, the property boundaries, you throw it all into one pot, uh, you're doing all this on paper, then you rearrange it in whatever ideal way you have, which is like maybe we say this is the risky zone, so we can build here, or if it starts to erode, then we have a mechanism that will allow some entity to take over this land and some way to make these people whole. And uh, it's very scary. And then you reallocate the land and you give everybody supposedly the equivalent value, but it may take a different form. And you may be able to create a lot of efficiencies to create more value. It's what they did. They could never keep the floods out of home if they hadn't done this kind of program. And uh, you know, the, the other advantages that, that people can do it in a cooperative way. Uh, it does not have to be co-ed from outside. Um, but it's still extremely scary and it would be a big leap for America. But, you know, we have to start thinking about things in this way. But, I mean, that, that kind of process is about to happen in, in Detroit, for example, or at least it's being discussed. Yeah. It's slightly different. Yeah, but I mean, also, people can look at it in terms of, in New Orleans, places that look the same are actually subtly different, or dramatically different in terms of prisons. They're a little lower, they're a little near or something more vulnerable or something, and, uh, you know, do you dare think of a way that would amalgamate the riskiest parts and help people to find a way to move? Now, people didn't want to move after Katrina. A lot of people regarded as racist, but then you look at East New Orleans, which is where the black professionals lived, and it's not coming back or not coming back or vibrantly. So, okay. This is probably a really naive question, but, um, do you think that it would help if there were um, an overhaul of um, the federal um, sort of cabinet in terms of separating transportation from HUD from the EPA, which I know is not a cabinet um, component, um, but so that people weren't um, fighting for funds, but rather um, working together to make things happen. And I know that theoretically right now, transportation and HUD and the EPA are supposed to be working together for development, but um, they're still fighting to get Congress. their share. Yeah, I mean, in fact, there's been uh, a lot of excitement about these grants across these boundaries, um, because a lot of people spontaneously tell me how excited they are about either competing for them or getting them up and going around and asking people. Because it's a very, very small program. But, you know, the, and Congress, I think, does even not even understand it. Uh, they have no idea. This is so it's sort of flying below the radar, but also involves some very little money right now. Um, and so if it shows some successes, then uh, I think it can move forward. The other thing is it does take leadership. I mean, in New York, Mayor Bloomberg has said, it shall happen. And uh, so it began to happen at least some, some people in this room do speak much more. Um, but you seem to imply that. that the city, I mean, the very point yeah. itself is, is, a, is the cities may well be the agents of this power action. Well, it is so far. They are so far. Now, but it will it I city. see uh, cities writ large, you know, not just older cities, although all the innovations that be happening in older cities. But it's beginning to go out into the suburbs. I think that's really caught some people's attention was, um, you know, Tyson's Corner, which is the Uber-ish city, uh, walk inside of Washington. 
you know, totally automobile oriented. But when there was a debate about extending the metro in that direction, they were so on top of it, you know, your head was spinning. It's like, we want it, we need it, and it's got to go here by my property. No, it's got to go here by my property. Basically, ties into this triangle. It has been strangling because it's totally dependent on auto. It can't be efficiently served by buses. They are so dying to get on the metro line. Uh, and that is what these people are beginning, you know, a lot of places are beginning to realize. They're stagnating. And when you look at the edge cities that uh, Joel Garrow talked about in the 90s, which is the hot new thing, most of them have either stagnated or they're maybe perking, perking along at a relatively growth rate. Schomburg outside of Chicago, which was where Penny's went, Sears went, up in the states and down the road. It's actually lost population since it's peak over the decades. Um, and I, there's been rumors that Sears is actually thinking of moving back downtown, just as uh, a Swiss bank, VS, is that it? Is now thinking of abandoning its giant trading floor in Stanford and in Bedford City. Now, this is not a trend to make, but it suggests that people are really looking at these um, uh, questions in a way they were not. Seems like a good opportunity to move over to have sure. a glass of wine and water, hopefully um, buy a book, and um, thank Jim for coming. Thanks for coming.